Have you ever wondered where sea monsters come from? We usually imagine somewhere deep in the ocean, like the Mariana Trench. But the reality is, sea monsters actually come from land. Ever since the first animals left the ocean around 400 million years ago, their descendants have been trying to get right back in. And those that do, they somehow almost always end up near the top of the food chain. Take the ichthyosaurs. Descending from reptilian land-dwelling ancestors, they plunged into the ocean 250 million years ago, and quickly proved to be massively successful, evolving into everything from colossal apex predators, to swift, agile prey, and everything in between. But they're not alone. Plenty others did the exact same thing, like the plesiosaurs, the pliosaurs, the mosasaurs, the list really goes on and on. Yet of all the creatures that returned to the sea, the whale stands in a category of its own. While they're often seen as gentle giants today, their common name, cetacean, hints at a more unsettling truth, as it literally translates to large sea monster. And to truly understand why, we need to look at their evolutionary journey. 66 million years ago, an asteroid the size of Mount Everest hits Earth faster than a bullet, unleashing chaos so devastating that around 75% of all species were completely wiped out. Some of its most famous victims include, of course, the non-avian dinosaurs, but they were far from the only casualties. Looking to the skies was the loss of the pterosaurs, the first vertebrates to ever conquer the air. And below, in the depths of the ocean, were the large marine reptiles, including all of the mosasaurs and plesiosaurs abruptly closing a nearly 200 million year reign of apex reptilian ocean dwellers. But there was a silver lining, as all of this death led to the opening of many niches that would allow new animals to occupy them. The very first whales were known as the Archaeocetes, and they were much different than their later flippered deep sea descendants. As odd as it may seem, Whales are actually a member of the same group that makes up today's hooved animals, like deer, pigs, and hippo. The earliest known cetacean, Pachycetus, clearly shows this ancestral line. Living around 50 million years ago in what is now Pakistan, it still possessed four fully functional legs, complete with small hooved toes. Roughly the size of a wolf measuring 4-5 to five feet in length, it is considered the most basal or primitive member of the whale lineage. And while it was originally believed they were semi-aquatic, it turns out they were fully terrestrial. So, rather than living in the water, the first whales lived near its edges, occasionally venturing into the water to feed on fish. The only reason we know Pachycetus was a whale at all is thanks to a unique feature hidden in its skull, called the bola. This specialized ear bone can be found in every single cetacean to this day, and greatly helps in hearing underwater and enables things like echolocation. The next so-called step in whale evolution was with Ambulocetus, another transitional species that appeared 48 million years ago, and like Pachycetus before it, also emerged in Pakistan. Many early whales came from this region because it was once home to an ancient ocean called the Tethys. Interestingly, due to tectonic shifts and the closing of the sea, ancient whale fossils can be found all the way from the middle of the desert to the tops of mountains. Among these fossils, Ambulocetus showcases many adaptations that made them much better suited for marine environments. While still retaining functional legs, Ambulocetus was far less adept on land than its predecessors. This was due to the fact its legs became shorter and more compact, much like those of today's river otters. As a result of this transformation, Ambulocetus was among the first whales to develop its awkward up and down swimming motion that would come to later define all fully aquatic cetaceans. At lengths of 10 to 12 feet, Ambulocetus was capable of targeting much larger prey. Its streamlined body, elongated snout, and high set eyes suggest it may have used crocodile-like ambush tactics. On top of this, they represent the first whales to ever enter the oceans, though their range was restricted to coastal regions, until later species expanded further. Whether due to abundant food, less competition, or a mix of both, the move to the water proved to be a resounding success for these early cetaceans and they began to further occupy the roles left vacant by the long-extinct marine reptiles. 
Because of this, in a relatively short window of time, these animals began rapidly evolving traits that pushed them further and further toward a fully aquatic lifestyle. 47 million years ago, they began exploring the open ocean, with the first whales ever found outside of the Indian subcontinent. Others began to show signs of early blowhole development, as their nostrils gradually migrated towards the top of their heads. By 46 million years ago, the first whales crossed the Atlantic. Likewise, some began developing the first tail flukes. Yet, even these early whales were still not fully aquatic, as evidence from their remains suggests they would have to return to land to give birth. It wouldn't be until 40 million years ago that the first fully aquatic whales were traversing the oceans. They were called the Basilosaurids, and the largest of them all was Basilosaurus. No longer restricted by the size constraints of life on land, these ancient whales grew to truly massive proportions. This was aided by the fact that Basilosaurus was built much differently than modern whales, as their bodies were slimmer and serpentine in comparison reaching sizes similar to the length of the sperm whale at about 60 feet. In addition to their unique body structure, Basilosaurus had a very primitive skull that bore a closer resemblance to land-dwelling carnivores than modern aquatic mammals. Curiously, many of these adaptations resemble those of prehistoric reptiles. This resemblance even led early paleontologists to mistakenly classify Basilosaurus as a marine reptile, earning it the misleading name King Lizard. While the lizard part of that name was certainly a mistake, the king part was actually spot on. Basilosaurus was one of the first true apex predators among whales, preying on large fish, sharks, and even fellow basilosaurids, like the 16 foot long Duradon, whose remains show signs of being feasted on by these serpent-like whales. This basilosaurid supremacy marked the peak of the Archaeocetes, but it wouldn't last. Around 34 million years ago, the eocene oligocene extinction event brought a dramatic drop in global temperatures. This shift spelled the end for the basal cetaceans, and set the stage for the rise of modern whales. Unlike the archaeocetes that came before them, the neocetes or new whales were better equipped to adapt to the changing world. Today's cetaceans fall into two groups. Baleen whales, mysticetes, and toothed whales, odontocetes. This division defines not only their diets and hunting strategies, but their entire way of life. Let's start with the mysticetes. Today, these animals are known for a few things. One of them is their baleen. Made up of the same fibers as human hair, they use these giant brushes to filter feed on massive swarms of krill. They're also known for their absolutely gigantic sizes making them the largest animals in all of Earth's history. Their origins, however, were much more humble. Early baleen whales only measured 10 to 15 feet in length, closer to the size of modern dolphins. One reason the size of these early whales was so limited is because they had not yet evolved the baleen that would go on to define their descendants. Interestingly, while all mysticetes are toothless today, they retain a connection to their toothy past developing teeth in the womb only to lose them before birth. This evolutionary shift coincided with dramatic environmental changes during the Oligocene. Due to the cooling climate, massive polar ice caps began forming, particularly in Antarctica. This shift transformed ocean circulation, creating powerful conveyor belts of cold, nutrient-rich water. These waters sparked an explosion in plankton populations, which thrived in the sunlit layers of the sea. As plankton flourished, krill and other small organisms that fed on them became abundant. This abundance created a golden opportunity for animals capable of bulk feeding to dominate. And while these early whales were still adapted to hunting fish and squid, it wouldn't take very long for new feeding methods to develop. One early baleen whale, the 10 foot long Aetiocetus, perfectly illustrates this transitional phase. Fossil evidence reveals it had both teeth and early baleen structures, thought to have been used to capture prey through suction feeding, a precursor to modern filter feeding. This gradual evolution set the stage for the rise of today's giant whales. By the Miocene epoch, around 10 to 5 billion years ago, the earth had gotten even colder, which made the already massive numbers of krill and plankton go nuclear. Baleen whales, now fully equipped with the highly efficient baleen plates, could now filter massive amounts of tiny organisms with minimal effort. 
giving them a competitive edge that would push their bodies to the biological limits of size. That's why we have massive animals like humpbacks, fin whales, bowheads, whose baleen can actually grow to about 13 feet long. But the largest of any whale, the blue whale, is so massive that with just a single gulp, it can eat up to 80,000 liters of water or 2 million calories worth of krill. And at about 100 feet long and nearly 200 tons, it's the largest animal to ever live. What's fascinating about this though, is that almost all of these truly gigantic whales evolved only in the last few million years, hinting at factors beyond just prey availability that may have been limiting their sizes. One theory was that the presence of large oceanic predators like Megalodon that consistently preyed on these smaller baleen whales may have made it so growing too large was just too dangerous in these prehistoric oceans. But giant sharks weren't the only predators these baleen whales had to worry about, as the other branch of the neocetes, the tooth whales, were just as deadly, evolving traits that made them more efficient hunters. One of their most remarkable adaptations is echolocation. By using a specialized organ called the melon, they emit clicks and interpret the returning echoes to locate prey which allows them to navigate and hunt in complete darkness. As it turns out, this adaptation, much like the evolution of baleen and mysocetes, may have been influenced by the cooling oceans. These colder waters became far murkier due to an increase in microorganisms, and changes in salinity meant that materials, which previously dissolved in the warmer waters, now remained suspended. As a result, sight became far less useful pushing toothed whales to rely increasingly on their sense of sound. This ability allowed them to dive deeper than ever before, unlocking new hunting opportunities in the darkest reaches of the ocean. Some species, like beaked whales, can even reach depths of nearly 10,000 feet. Others, like sperm whale, the largest toothed predator ever, have specialized in hunting colossal squids at depths of over 3,000 feet, using powerful clicks not just to locate their prey, but potentially to stun or disorient them. To put the power of these clicks into perspective, a jet engine at takeoff reaches up to 140 decibels, while a sperm whale's clicks can hit an astonishing 230 decibels. That's the loudest sound in the entire animal kingdom, and considering that sound travels more efficiently through water, the impact of these clicks is even more extraordinary. Other toothed whales like orcas are the most dangerous predators in the ocean. Commonly referred to as killer whales, they've been seen actively hunting other top predators like great whites, occasionally seen drowning blue whales, and often work together to create waves that knock seals off ice flows. Though, while the orca is a top predator today, if you look back just 10 million years ago, there was one toothed whale that was a direct competitor to giants like the Megalodon. This was the Leviathan Melvelli. Its name comes from the Leviathan of the Bible and Herman Melville, the author of Moby Dick. And it was one of the most fearsome predators of its time. Though just slightly smaller than Megalodon at around 17 meters, looking at their teeth shows you the whole scale. While Megalodons were about 6 inches long, Leviathans were over a foot long. For scale, these teeth were about the size of a 2 liter bottle of soda, making them the largest teeth of any animal. As you can see, when it comes to size, whales pretty much hold all the records. And if you ever want to learn about some other ancient giant predators, go watch my video here about the Permian's version of the T-Rex. Anyways though, going from wolf-sized hooved carnivores to the largest sea monsters of the ocean is a pretty incredible story, and it makes you think. If the whales ever go extinct, what will be the next sea monsters to replace them?